getting right. Thanks everyone for joining. We're gonna give uh, participants a few minutes to, uh, to join us. So we'll get started, uh, let's say in, in three or four minutes. Joe, how are things across the pond today? Sunny. That's uh, good. It seems to have gone away for a little while. So we're basking in it while we can. I was out in a t-shirt today, which is uh, <laughs> probably quite brave still, but. Yeah, this is, these are new experiences for you. <laughs> they certainly are. Same here. Uh, it's it's eighty and sunny uh, in in Cleveland, and uh, it'll snow tomorrow probably, uh, and we'll be gray for another month, and then it'll be ninety, hundred degrees and scorching. There's no spring anymore. I'm convinced that global warming has eliminated spring as a a season. Yeah. Yeah, the trees started coming out quite early this year, like February time, and then they stalled. They just stopped for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Yeah, Mother Nature does not know what to do. For those that are joining, we're just going to give uh, participants a few more minutes to join our webinar. So just sit tight and uh, we'll get started in a few. Any bank holidays coming up? Yeah, we've got the, um, we always have one at the beginning of May. Uh, the end of May, but there's also the King's coronation as well. So we've got three in May this year. Very nice. Mm. I was always jealous of those bank holidays. Yeah, we just had two for Easter as well. So we uh, we tend to like front load them all. You get you get one in H two before Christmas, and that's it. So we like go strong in H one. I see a few more people joining, so we're just going to give it a few more minutes. Hang tight. We'll get started. Maybe six past the hour. And you're not in London. You're just north. Is that right? I'm in London. I'm in North you London. So, yeah. If you know the tube map, I'm in zone two. I do know the tip map. Yeah. So leafy, but convenient is probably the best way to phrase it. Take that. Yeah. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining myself and Joe today uh, on our webinar about unlocking a business growth, how we're going to use connected recruiting and various talent experiences to drive value metrics that impact business performance. This is a pretty exciting topic. I love this. I know Joe loves it. My name is Andre Maletti. I'm the product evangelist for talent experience at Bullhorn. I'm joined by my colleague, Joe McGuire, who is a sales and strategy director of analytics uh, for Bullhorn. Uh, fun fact, uh, Joe and I share something in common uh, and it's not that we don't have any hair. We actually both came from acquisition. So Joe came from Cube 19 uh, and I came from uh, from Able. Anything else you want to add, Joe, or you think that's good enough? We can get right into it. Well, I was wondering if it's the uh, Bullhorn strategy to acquire companies with uh, bald CROs, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And here we are. Uh, and we're going to jam on a really, really exciting topic today. Before we do get into uh, the details, let's go ahead and do some housekeeping. So session is being recorded, as many of you know. Everyone except for Joe and myself will be on mute. Uh, and then we're going to hopefully have five minutes at the end, maybe even 10, to have a little Q&A, which you'll be able to use uh, the chat function in our Zoom webinar. For those of you in healthcare, we've got a pretty exciting webinar coming up in mid-May around how to grow your healthcare VMS business. So go ahead and snap a photo of that QR code. Uh, that's gonna be one. If you are in healthcare, uh, you don't wanna miss. Okay, so this is what we want you to leave here uh, with today, right? So how can you take actionable insights to drive business outcomes, right? And what are actually actionable insights? We're going to have to define that. And Joe Scott, Joe spends a lot of his time getting companies to understand that this is the key to growth by becoming an insights-driven company. 
we're also going to need to cover the difference between performance metrics and business metrics, right? Because actionable insights aren't just gleaned from looking at top level business metrics like gross margin. You really need to get into desk level analytics. Uh, and those are performance metrics. So we need to define those. We want you to leave here today with an understanding of those two. And then finally, how do you become an insights driven organization? What are the first steps you need to take in order to become one? What do you think, Joe? Did I miss anything or is that essentially what we want to cover? Sounds great to me. Okay, <laughs> good. Good. Well, we can't get started without really understanding how we got here, right? Why is, why is this happening? Why is becoming an insights driven organization so important today? Uh, and there's a paradigm shift that is happening, which I want us to dive into a little bit to set the stage uh, as to the importance of the topics that we're covering today. And this isn't new to staffing, right? This is this has happened in other industries. Joe came from other industries. I came from retail and from the travel industries that went through digital transformation. And there's patterns that happen here, right? So when an industry goes through digital transformation, we see a pattern. Uh, most importantly, core services seem to lose value, right? So the way something that was incredibly important to your customer, or in our case, to talent uh, in the past is now less and less important. Uh, your performance of your traditional channels seems to falter, right? The way you are able to initiate and conduct business don't seem to work as great anymore. Uh, yet you're doing the same thing. So something happens there. I want you to remember those two because we're going to show you some data later that backs that up. Ultimately, there is a shift in power between yourself and the customer, right? There is a dynamic where you are not necessarily in control of the process anymore. Uh, in our case, you're not interviewing talent. Talent are interviewing you, right? So this is, this is the, the status of the industry, right? This is digital transformation as it impacts an industry as a whole, right? So there's organizations that come out of this bigger and better, right? There's organizations that expand the gap between the lower majority and your high performers. So what do those transformational organizations do? Because there's patterns on the backside of this as well. Those transformational organizations become incredibly focused on customer experience, in our case, talent experience, right? They become very aware that it is that you have to be incredibly sensitive to all of those touch points, right? And then you need to lean on insights to inform changes to those business processes to improve the overall performance, right? They become aware of everything that matters to their customer base. And then they become obsessed about measuring and informing the business on how to make changes to continually improve that. And they don't just do it once, they become vigilant and obsessed at innovating and optimizing these journeys. Right. We see this, we saw this in travel, we saw this in finance, we saw this in retail, and we're seeing it in the staffing industry today. Do you believe me or not, right? Is this happening or am I just, this is great introductory fodder for our conversation today? Well, let's look at the data. What is the data telling us? Now, we're going to look at some grid report uh, from this year where we interviewed agencies, and then also last year's talent trends report, where we interviewed over 2,000 uh, temp workers that worked for an agency in the last year. 66% of workers, these are temp workers that worked with an agency within the last year, abandoned a promising opportunity because the process took so long and it stunk. If you remember back to my first item of uh, the pattern that happens when an industry goes through digital transformation, this is a data point that exactly validates that claim, right? And this tells me that we don't necessarily have a talent shortage. We've got a talent, a leaky talent funnel. Another one is that 8%, only 8% of talent cited positive recruiter interaction as a reason why they chose to work for an agency. This is heartbreaking because our industry is based on recruiter interaction, right? It is the bedrock, the foundation of, of, of our uh, our organizations. Uh, so something is happening there, right? There's a change in dynamics that we need to really understand and get into. Uh, and the best way to do that is to become an insights driven organization to get down to the underlying details as to what talent expectations are today and how we need to tack accordingly from a combination of people, process, and technology 
to make that happen. So are we aware of this as an industry yet? It's one thing to actually go out and put the, the process, um, initiate the changes, but are we even convinced that this is the case yet? And this is a little troubling as well. I'm sorry I'm scaring everybody this morning with all of these, these very morbid facts and, and, and data points. Um, we asked talent why they chose to work for an agency in the past year. And then we asked agencies, why do they think talent chose to work for them? And the answers were the inverse, right? So there's an education that still needs to happen. As an industry, we're not tuned into what is really happening yet. We still think that the old way of doing things is just going to be okay. And that we don't really need to get in tune with the new value system that talent is telling us is important to them, right? We need to be able to change this inverse effect that's happening. Uh, and the best way to do that is to shed a light on it. So transformational organizations become insights driven. And how do they do that, right? Becoming an insights driven organization doesn't show up on your doorstep. You don't buy insight software, right, Joe? You buy business intelligence and you invest in data analytics, but insights is something that needs to be earned and needs to be gleaned from looking at the correct data points. And that's what Joe and I are about to get into, right? Because there is a system, there is a process that you can follow Bullhorn is investing in educating the industry on this process and we're building tools and services and technology to aid in our customer's ability to become an insights driven firm, right? So let's go through that system now. Many of you are aware of business metrics, right? It is part of the system, it is needed. It is one of the foundational building blocks. There's four of them. These are your high level KPIs, your big rocks that sit in the boardroom Everyone knows them as time to fill and gross margin. Uh, they're usually the CFO and the CEO cares about it. And you look at it once a quarter, or potentially monthly, maybe even once a year, or maybe even not at all, or you're not looking at the right ones. They're out there. Those are key high level business metrics. They're important and they're a key part of our foundation. Joe, anything you want to add about business metrics? I, I think they're fundamentally important. I think KPIs across the business are very important um, and making sure that they're being looked at in the right way is, is really the key thing I think you're going to come on to in the moment. Great. The next part of our building block is, is key to the foundation, right? And that is those actionable insights, right? Um, Joe, I'm going to let you cover this one because this is your bread and butter. Tell us about actionable insights and why are they different uh, from just looking at business KPIs? Yeah, I, I think they're fundamentally different in the way that there's there's so many different use cases for data, um, not just in, in the staffing industry, but all industries. And um, I think there's actually a bit of a misalignment on how data is used or really the value that can be extracted from data in this industry. I think um, the most common use case for data is, is looking at what has happened, looking at success metrics, including uh, business metrics and the performance metrics you'll come on to but knowing where we were successful or perhaps weren't successful is extremely important we have to track our KPIs but actionable insights are so important because they're actually more of a leading indicator they're more of a, 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 a driver of action and behavioral change at the desk level so once you've identified what levers you're trying to change or, or pull making sure that the recruiters, the sales reps, anyone on the front line who's actually can, can drive um, positive change the fastest has metrics and data in front of them that show them the things they should do today to be more successful tomorrow, rather than always looking back at if we were successful yesterday. Yeah, I like that. That's important. The, the insights inform business change, and you don't get them from just looking at business metrics. And I think you just tease this out, right? So where do you get how do you create desk level change to actually impact business performance? Well, you have to look at desk level in, um, metrics and those are known as our performance metrics, right? These are the ones that are aligned with uh, your recruiting engine, right? Your talent funnels. These are the metrics that fit below your business metrics that are on the front lines. And this is where you glean your actionable insights. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Knowing, tracking and benchmarking where you are today should inform where you're trying to, uh, should inform where you need to tweak and change to improve tomorrow. 
And they are the drivers and the foundation for which actionable insights are relevant for which people within the business. And they should vary. They should be different. Got it. And then based on, there's, let's say, well, at Bullhorn, we've identified, I want to say, 13 performance metrics that various, depending on vertical, there's not, it can cover the entire talent life cycle, right? Your entire recruiting and HR operation. But some of them might be more important than others based on the type of business that you run, based on your strategy and your go-to-market. Is that right? So it's more of an understanding of which ones to hone in on so that you can actually initiate those, those changes that you want to make. Completely. And I, I think um, you know, market conditions will absolutely play a part in which metrics are more important at which time. Um, and also perhaps the, the skills of the individuals within the business. You know, some are stronger in certain areas than others. So making sure that, that all of the information and, and context is considered before taking strong action. That's a good point. I didn't even think of that, you know, in a, a talent shortage or a talent surplus, your, your performance metrics, the ones that you focus on are going to be different. So you need to put in the effort to identify the type of organization you are, the market conditions so that you really hone in on which performance metrics you need to adjust. Uh, and then of course, looking at um, trends, right, over time and potentially working with partners to identify what industry benchmarks that you can measure yourself against uh, or industry averages or what high performers are doing, right? Working with customer success teams at your vendors to be able to identify uh, which ones to hone in on. I think a lot of that work uh, is, is key or else you won't be able to, you might be able to get actionable insights, but it might be for the wrong performance metrics. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally is the a framework, right? You need a foundation. Like, let's say you identify the performance metrics that you need to focus on. You, you figure out the ones that require your attention and then you glean actionable insights uh, in order to initiate change. You need to go back to some sort of framework uh, or levers, if you will, where you actually take action on the insights that you glean, right? And this is our system. Uh, this is people, process, and technology, right? This is your framework. Um, that's how you you go from an idea to execution to then improve uh, overall business. So let's go into each one of these uh, in detail. And I know we started at the top and worked our way down. Now what we're going to do is start at the bottom and work our way up, right? Let's talk about framework. There's a ton of different frameworks you can use. At Bullhorn, we've created a framework called Connected Recruiting, right? Where as of today, uh, we built it as a set of best practices to help uh, organizations um, drive better engagement across the entire talent lifecycle. Well, we're evolving that framework to include more of the talent experience, not just the engagement portions. And it really begins with identifying your talent life cycle, right? And breaking this into specific buckets and categories and stages, because then you can drive personalization, you can drive personas, you can drive st strategies specific to the stages of the talent life cycle. Once you have that identified, you can start identifying what are those key levers, right? What are those touch points that if you deliver a really, really great experience, you can move the needle on a performance metric. We call these the moments that matter. We've identified over 20 key moments that matter along the hiring journey that we would want to see our customers focus on. And they're not all going to be have coverage around bullhorn products and services. Some of these are outside of our scope. Some of them can be supported by marketplace partners or just general internal efforts for an organization. But these are the key touch points that if you really, really want to create high velocity and build a flywheel, you need to draw your attention to. I know I'm going through them fast. Don't worry, all this content is going to be available on our Connected Recruiting microsite, as well as the recording that we'll send out after the session. And so that's our framework. We have the talent life cycle. We have the moments that matter. Those are our levers. The actionable insights that we glean, we're going to go pull some of these levers. 
we glean those insights from performance metrics, right? So you're delivering on all these moments that matter. Are you being successful or not? Are you moving the needle? How do we get 66% talent drop off because the experience stinks to 40%, right? Or even 30%. How do we get positive recruiter interaction up? Well, we need to start measuring things along the hiring journey, right? Along our talent life cycle. Our moments that matter are directly related to the metrics that matter, right? These are our performance metrics. These are our desk level data points that we want to look at on a regular basis. And then compare them, of course, historically compare them to market trends. And of course, like Joe said, identify the ones that are important to you based on the type of business you are, as well as the market conditions. Joe, anything you want to add to these, these desk level KPIs? Um, I would say that I, I think we're lucky to work in an industry where um, there's a high level of motivation and a great work ethic. So I think it's our responsibility as leaders to support our teams to make sure they've got the tools, the data points and the information they need to improve return on effort they're putting in because almost every time there's a lot of effort happening. And I think this whole framework really starts to articulate that, that there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of um, expectation on on recruiters and sales reps across the industry and by making some small tweaks and some we, uh, marginal gains we can have really big uh, success and outcome from these things and we can really help our teams be more successful in, in everything they're doing yeah it's a good point it's marginal gains right you're not looking to hit a home run you just need small um, to use a baseball analogy I know Joe this is not going to fly with you right? But you need to just play small ball <laughs> or money ball, if you will, right? How do I, how do I reduce candidate acquisition costs by 10%? Well, you just need to incrementally improve a couple key of these performance metrics in order to do that, right? Small micro changes. It might be content. It might be a little more personalization. It might be an investment in a better onboarding process for I-9, et cetera. It's these little changes that are going to impact the numbers down the road. Now, which ones to do and, and what actually, how do you get the action plan for that? Well, that's our next piece, right? The insights. Joe, I'm going to let you take this one as well. Yeah. So I suppose following on from, from um, my comments earlier, the, the industry, I think, as a whole, generally speaking, measures the past, what has happened. Traditional volume-based metrics, which are extremely important. They play a very important part. I'm not saying stop measuring them. Quite the opposite. But what I'm saying is uh, if you can uh, support those metrics and support uh, staff and users within the business with actionable insights to help guide them on how to improve the KPI numbers, that's really where these marginal gains and successes can come from. So we've, we've put three examples on the screen. We're certainly not limited and restricted to three. These actionable insights actually should flow from the, uh, the inception of the business development process all the way through the, the sourcing, deployment, and redeployment. But in terms of uh, what we're talking about today in Connected Recruiting, we're thinking about the candidate and talent side. Most companies will probably track how many leads, new, cont uh, new, new uh, candidate leads are being added to the system. But there should really, and needs to be an action that happens after the fact to drive any kind of result. So it's thinking about that. What's the next step in the process and how can we prompt and remind people to take that next step? So the example here on leads would be, well, let's show our recruiters which leads we've added to the system that we haven't actually been in contact with, whether that be an SMS, an email, a telephone call, an automation. The contact part is subjective to the business processes, and hopefully it will be all of the above that I've just mentioned. But it's about how can we help recruiters cut through the noise and remember the specific things they're meant to be doing, exactly when they're meant to be doing them and who with, rather than just the volume element of it. Now, if we think about interviews, interviews is, of course, an important part of the, uh, the sourcing process. But in a talent short market, it's important to make sure that the candidate placement rate is as high as possible. So rather than just getting uh, a, a candidate, an interview of a single client, well, chance of placing that candidate is going to be um, pretty low, like typically about 20 percent, one in five, if you just present them to one client. So getting them in front of a second client often will increase the chance of placing that candidate by about 50%. So how can we prompt and remind recruiters rather than just arrange a volume of interviews, 
actually, if you work a, a, this candidate a, a little bit more, get them in front of just one more or two more clients, you will significantly increase the chance of placing that talent. And to Andre's point earlier on, uh, we need to get better at, at um, uh, I suppose, uh, shoring up the leaks in the bucket of the, the, the talent funnel. So um, rather than just saying we need more talent, we need to get better at utilizing the talent we already are working with. So silver medalists, this is really where that would come into the conversation. Um, and redeployment, you know, uh, contractor and temporary deployment, in my opinion, is the biggest missed opportunity in the global staffing market. If you look at the numbers across the industry, they're very low in terms of the percentage of um, temps who are redeployed into their very next role by the same agency that had them in their previous, very low. Um, I would encourage everyone to go and look at this, this stat and data in your own business. But knowing that number is only the starting point. It's the benchmark and barometer of where the opportunity is or how much opportunity still lies, and it's big. So how do you improve and, and make sure that we're capitalizing on the opportunity? Well, um, if you can put a metric in front of recruiters that shows them the uh, people coming off assignment that have not had the relevant activities to redeploy, client submissions, interviews, or whatever might suit your workflows, that's what moves the needle. That's what drives improvements in performance. And to, to finish the point here, looking at just volume-based metrics, if, if logically, if you're saying we want to double what we're doing today, it means you have to double the volume to, to achieve double the outcome. Whereas actually, if, if you're looking more at the actionable insight and the specific action and the timing of that action, actually making small changes in the process throughout can have huge benefits to the outcome and the, the gross margin that, that each person in the business is capable and able to bring in. Good stuff. And this is great because we have a case study that we're gonna share here in a few slides that talks about just that, right? How to move the needle by making incremental adjustments and driven by the right insights. Before we do do that, we do have one more, is the business metrics, right? To move the needle on time to fill or candidate or customer acquisition cost or gross margin or placements for recruiters, you don't put a plan together for your business metrics. It's the improvement of the performance metrics that makes that happen, right? So let's just look at this another way. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this one because I wanna visualize this as the process, right? We showed you that there is a system. Well, let's show you how that system works visually, right? You look at your performance metrics, right? You're, you're, you have a team that's analyzing them. It's not just enough that you have a dashboard in a system. You have a team that's analyzing them. Hopefully that dashboard is showing you anomalies, right? Red areas or gaps or areas that need to improve. And I know we've invested heavily in, in, in developing to drive actionable insights directly from Bullhorn Analytics. Um, so we have those performance metrics, but they lead us to those actionable insights, right? These numbers are low. Okay, well, what does that actually mean? What can I do about it, right? The actionable insights are going to inform our plan. What do we need to do with our framework? What do we actually need to execute within our levers to make that happen? What changes do we need to make to people, process, and technology? Let's go make those changes in real time, right? Fast iterations, right? You need to be agile in your ability. The smaller the improvement, the faster you can probably initiate it. You can't spend six months doing something, right? So if you can do micro adjustments across various metrics and moments that matter, you can actually move the needle without having massive investments. But you have to have the right technology in place. You need to have the right people. You need to have the right change management around business processes to make this happen. Well, sure enough, that will improve performance. Go look at the data. If it did, great. If it didn't, try something else, right? Iteration, being agile is incredibly important here. More times than not, more times than not, your actual insight is going to lead to positive business outcomes around those moments that matter, right? So then what happens? You improve the performance metrics, which in turn improves business performance, right? And we'll be able to see that uh, in our business metrics. It's that simple, right, Joe? Everyone can do this overnight. No big deal. Where are the challenges? Where is the pain here? And you've seen, because your job is to help organizations figure this out. Where are the missteps? Um, I think people going into this thinking they have to complete it. 
immediately. This is a journey. I talk about the data journey all of the time. It's, it's really a never ending journey because you're always gonna be making tweaks and iterations to what you're doing. Business uh, market conditions change, business situations change, challenges evolve. So you can never complete this. It's, uh, it's, it's iterate, continuously iterate is what I would encourage here and start small. Don't think you have to, like, like you just said, Andre, you don't have to invest big to start this process off or to, to move it on quite significantly. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's having an open mind, I think. Good. Okay, this is the fun part because we have, I'm not going to name the client, but I'm going to tell you it's a top 100 SIA commercial staffing firm that invested in this methodology that put in the right technology, the right people to get the right actionable insights. I'm gonna tell you their story today and I'm gonna show you their actual ROI around their performance and their business metrics. So in 2021, this client noticed that there was rising candidate acquisition costs. Much of this was driven by the job boards, right? They started their journey looking at that business level KPI and saw Candidate acquisition cost was rising, yet what was happening, right? What was happening with their performance metrics? They had over 3,000 jobs and they weren't growing, right? But top of funnel candidate spend wasn't moving the needle, right? This was their, their moment when they looked at the specific desk level KPIs and said, well, we need to do something here. Our database utilization, it's okay, but it could be better. Our class A jobs, we're not really matching immediately, right? They were looking at their performance metrics. They identified that they needed to do something. So what was the actual insight that they took? They needed to get recruiters to drive more class A job coverage, right? And they needed to build automation to drive better matching, right? This was their actionable insight. By looking at the data, which started from business metrics that moved over to performance metrics, they identified this as their action plan. So then they took that action plan and they went right back to their framework. And this is what they did. They invested in better job matching and AI. They brought in a third party to help them do that. They've also invested in better job classification uh, and building watchdogs and setting up the right types of automation so that recruiters were focused on job A class, sorry, class A communication and engagement with the right candidates as they came through. That wasn't happening before. They created talent lifecycle segmentation so that they could drive more personalized communication, right? They created personas based on the talent lifecycle so that in the engagement they had, whether it was personalized one-to-one -one or whether it was automated, they were driving better quality touch points, which in turn created a great talent experience. And you could see that in their open rates. That of course was more personalized, right? So it was really involving personalized recruiter engagement. Right. So this was their story. It started with the business metric. They looked at the desk level performance. They identified areas that they needed to focus on, which I'll show you those specifically in a second. They came up with their actionable insight. They went right into their framework and said, we need to make changes to these four or five areas. Joe, this, um, this path here, is it as linear as we're making it sound? How can, what, or, what, body within a business organization needs to drive this, right? Because this touches a lot of people. It touches technology groups, recruiting ops. It, rec it impacts people at the desk level. There might be financial implications if you need to invest in technology. I mean, this is, a, this is a, an initiative here. It's important to have the right technology in place. So you're really just making software and configuration changes, but I'm guessing it could get a little sticky. Uh, depending on how many organizations or parts of your organization are involved, right? Yeah, I, I think what I've seen a trend in over the last few years is that the companies that are utilizing data the best, the ones that have data in front of everyone, not just leadership, you know, making sure that, that appropriate optimized data is in front of the right people actually is helping um, bridge the gap between departments. It's actually bringing departments closer together and, and collaboration is, is increasing because it's not just reliant on a person or a certain job role to take ownership and, and identify these things even. 
you know, if, if team managers or even sometimes recruiters or, or uh, sales reps have got access to the right data, they will be asking new questions, questions that perhaps the business hasn't even posed before. And that then triggers different conversations in different departments. And that cross-team collaboration, I think, is so important. Yeah, of course, it, too many cooks, you know, and, uh, and so on. But it, it, if, if everyone is aiming for the right thing, then I think team collaboration is so important and data is the thing that's helping drive that. But it is fundamentally um, essential for leadership to be driving the ultimate change in behavior and, and evolution of the business. That's leadership's role. So uh, there, you will struggle if you can't get leadership by him. Um, but I think it, it's the responsibility of everyone in the company to, to be working to, to be better, to improve. Great. Thanks for that. So this client, who, by the way, if you do come to engage this year in Boston, will be on stage with me uh, and talking about specifically the changes they made uh, to the framework and the technology. Uh, we'll be getting into the details. Um, so they made those changes, right? They made those investments into the framework. Let's see what happened to performance and business metrics. Database utilization from 21 versus 22 went up 9%. By the way, this company, when we looked at some other um, comparable organizations within the, the same segment that ran similar business models and supported similar verticals, they were already well ahead of uh, what other organizations were doing from a database utilization rate. And from 2021 to 2022, the industry actually went down in database utilization 3% they actually went up 9%. So in a down year, when they were already outperforming, they were able to still increase utilization. 50% engagement open rates, right? By focusing on personalization, which was driven by that segmentation, and by focusing on class A jobs and creating those watchdogs and driving the automation for recruiters to focus on the right people with the right jobs, with the right message, with the right persona, they were able to increase open rates by 50%. The class A placements, this is huge, right? They, in 2021, 21, prior to them making this, this change, they were only placing 33% of their class A jobs. After these changes, they got it up to 77% of all placements were from class A jobs. Their open jobs went from 3,000 down to 1,500. And all, of course, those are all your performance metrics. And what happened to the business metric? Their candidate acquisition costs went from $7.34 to $6.73, which is a little over an 8% reduction. Micro adjustments, these were things that happened. This was from late 2021 to mid 2022. Micro adjustments, not massive investments in business process, not massive investments in technology. There was some tech spend there. We'll get into that in the engaged session. Uh, but this is how you initiate change, right? This is how being an insights-driven organization can lead to positive business outcomes. And they're not done here. They're looking to now, how can we actually get that acquisition cost number from 673 to sub six, right? And now they're gonna look at other parts of their organization. So it's the framework, right? This is one little success story and it's not, and they're not done. And we don't want any organization to be done. This is a play that needs to be put on repeat. You need to have the right people in your organization that are initiating this type of change. Joe, anything else to comment or add? No, I think you've, you've covered that perfectly. All right. So let us know about, Joe, tell us about how we can get started here, our three points. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is the shift in mindset. Um, I, I, you've referenced other industries previously in, in this call, and um, I think other industries are faster to transform, um, faster to realize value in data in particular and, and process improvements. So it's that, it's that shift in mindset. I think we're finding a lot of um, companies in the industry now are investing heavily in their reporting and analytics, but actually the reality is what they're doing is automating their previously manual reports. So they're getting the same data, the same output, maybe faster, maybe more, more cheap, but um, it's still the same data points. So I actually have a reminder, as you notice my coaster on my desk, is like, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. 
And that's a reminder that we've got to always be thinking, have an open mindset into to change um, and being more curious about things, not just accepting that the number is the number and hoping it will change or guessing what might change or hoping that people on the front line and the desk will actually know to change things. Asking questions, why? Why are things the way they are? How could we improve them? And making sure that there's that constant level of questioning. You know, I, I um, talk to customers a lot where when data uh, is more accessible, so come on to the final point that business intelligence is not just for the, for the C-suite. When data is more accessible to everybody, the questions that are being asked evolve significantly. If it's self-serve, if, if I can ask a question in my business and get an answer to it straight away, I almost guarantee I'll have a, a, an immediate new question off the back of the answer. And it's about that continuous evolution. I think a lot of companies in this industry in particular has always been focused on management information, MI. Again, hugely important, but there tends to be a disconnect between what um, the top uh, of the business know or want and the actions that people are, are on the desk are, are taking. So making sure that um, business intelligence is spread across the organization, making sure it's optimized for the person so they're not lost in noise and data that they don't understand, but making sure that each and every individual in the company knows their impact, how, how their small part of that company and what they're doing is contributing to the overall strategy, vision, and um, expectations of the company as a whole. And I think data helps communicate that uh, and it helps motivate and drive behavioral change throughout the business. So I think it's, it's thinking about data in a new way and, and realizing actually the true value of data isn't looking backwards, it's looking forwards. I like that. Forwards and not backwards. Thanks, Joe. Okay, that concludes our presentation today. We do have a few minutes left. If there are any questions for myself or Joe, feel free to put them through the chat. There was one question about getting a copy of the recording. The answer is yes, we'll be sending that out via email. Steve Morin from Talent Launch. Glad you could join us, Steve. Thanks for coming. I guess everyone's uh, storing all their questions for you at Engage. They're gonna fire them at you when you're on stage. I think so. I think that's gonna be the case. So, um, well, I think we're right at time. If there's no questions, I see people slowly leaving the, uh, the session. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, any last words, Joe? There's a question that's just come in there actually. What, what uh, KPI is the companies, uh, the most companies measure? Um, I, I think some of the business metrics that Andre referenced earlier, like GM time to fill, uh, candidate acquisition costs, fill rates, things like that. Uh, I think they're quite common metrics. What I would encourage is um, thinking about your business and what um, key drivers are of performance metrics. So I, I think they really should vary. Um, I, I think a lot of companies are still thinking about things like volume of jobs added, number of submissions, number of interviews, but they're all typically volume-based metrics. So even though that might be still more than norm in this industry, and I think they should be measured still, I would absolutely encourage looking at your process within your business um, because industry uh, market conditions will all impact the type of metrics I think are important. So I'm happy to have a side conversation on that point as well, if you'd like, Kristen. I think the big one also, um, Chris and I've heard come up is just any sort of utilization, right? Database utilization has been an a tremendous investment in automation in the past in order to, and, and it's directly related to increased job board spend. We have this big database. Why are we spending money to bring more people in? There's a good chance they're already here. So utilization around your database is probably one of the key performance metrics that I think everyone in the industry should be 
should be focused on, uh, but not just database utilization. Uh, it's good to actually break it up right into existing candidate utilization as well as alumni utilization, right? I think those are key. So the minute you start splitting those up, you might start seeing different figures, right? The whole key is to peel another piece of the layer, get a little bit deeper down to the desk level because your actionable insight, the more granular, the more granular you get with performance metrics are gonna allow you to be more detailed and specific on what you need to do with your levers, right? So database utilization, new candidate versus alumni. What is the process to find a candidate for requirements? I'm not sure I followed that one. Anything on AI matching there maybe that would be appropriate? Maybe that's around skills-based matching, I'm not sure. Okay. okay, that might be it. Andre, thank you very much for having me today. Um, yes, thank you, Joe. It's been great. Thank you all. It's a topic that I'm uh, naturally very passionate about, like you are. So if anyone wants to connect directly with us and have a, have a side conversation, we'd be more than happy to do that. Thanks all again. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.